السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. I'm going to recite Surah Al-Taghavun from verse 9, chapter number 64, and the page is 556. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. يوم يجمعكم يوم الجمع ذلك يوم التغاب ومن يؤمن بالله ويعمل صالحا يكفر عنه سيئات ويدخله جنات تجري من تحتها الأنار خالدين فيها ذلك الفوز العظيم والذين كفروا وكذبوا بآياتنا أولئك أصحاب النار خالدين فيها وبئس المصير ما أصاب من مصيبة إلا بإذن الله ومن يؤمن بالله يهدي قلبه والله بكل شيء عليم وأطيعوا الله وأطيعوا الرسول فإن توليتم فإنما على رسولنا فإنما على رسولنا البلاء المبين الله لا وعلى الله فليتوكل المؤمنون يا أيها الذين آمنوا إن من أزواجكم وأولادكم إن من أزواجكم وأولادكم عدوا لكم فاحذروهم 
عيال الفلا حي على الفلا Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Shalom Allah, Ilaha Illallah, أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة
الحمد لله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمد عبد الله ورسوله All praise and thanks are due to Allah All praise and thanks are due to Allah All praise and thanks are due to Allah I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship than the one God Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the final messenger of God completing the long chain of messengers and prophets that includes Jesus and Moses and Abraham and all the prophets and messengers found in God's holy Quran may God's peace and blessings be upon them all inshallah my dear brothers and sisters just to my left here, to your right, here in the hall, is just on the other side of this wall, is the morgue of the Islamic Center of Southern California. I don't know if there is a body there right now, but that is where one day all of us will end up. It may not be here, maybe somewhere else, but one day we will all end up in a morgue. Yeah. Our lives will come to an end here, and our bodies will be in a morgue and our bodies will be washed inshallah in accordance with the rites of ghusl. And our bodies will be repaired. Our bodies will end up here, but we will not end up here. Our body may be on a table here, but our ruh, our soul, will not end up here. For core to our belief as Muslims, core to our tenets in Islam is the belief and the knowledge that our soul lives beyond our body. That our soul, which is in us now, we are breathing and living the biological specimen and biological bodies that we have now, survives after our bodies become old and frail and eventually fail. And that is, subhanAllah, something, to be very frank, that should give us hope. It is something, to be very honest, as we read about in the Quran, should give us happiness. For this life, as we all believe as Muslims, is not the only life. There is another life, there is the Akhirah. And in my khutbah today, which is called Life After Life, I will share some of the things about what our faith teaches us, and also talk about a growing human phenomena called near-death experiences and out-of-body experiences. Before I get too far afield on that, know, for example, the story of, the great story, the miraculous story of Isra and Miraj, where Rasulullah sallallahu left his body traveled to Jerusalem, went to the heavens, is part of the body of evidence of something called an out-of-body experience. And at the end of this khutbah, I hope that it is understood by myself and my soul that whatever trials and tribulations we are going through in this life, we should know and understand that this life is very short. That this life, this part of life, is the short, shorter part of the longer existence that we will have, inshallah, into the akhirah, into the next life. So, hence, my dear brothers and sisters, the topic that I am talking about today is a very big one. It's a very large one. It's not something that you're going to be able to cover in one khutbah or in one lecture series or even maybe a lifetime. Talking about what happens after we die. And let me share with you then what the Quran says about the topic. And in Surah Al-Isra, Isra, the 17th Surah, verse 85, it says, Bismillah ar rahim They ask you, O Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, concerning the ruh, the soul, say, it is one of the things that the knowledge of which is only with my Lord and the knowledge you of mankind have been given is very little. So we as human beings, whatever we do understand, 
whatever we are have experienced is only what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to know. That the Akhirah, as so beautifully described in the Quran, both the paradise that's described as well as hell, is something that is part of the description of the Quran, but it's only limited in what we as other human beings will understand. Regardless, in researching for this khutbah, we find that there are five stages that our soul goes through. Not our life, not our human life here, but our soul goes through. These are verses in the Quran that speak to that, those different stages, those five stages. The first stage is the creation of our soul. Not in our mother's wombs, but the creation of our soul in the heavenly realm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah An-Nisa, in the very first verse, O mankind, be conscious of your sustainer who has created you out of one living entity. God subhanahu wa ta'ala created you, created me, created all of humanity from one living entity, as told to us here in the Quran. What does that mean? Our souls, before they came to our mother's womb, were in the heavenly realm, and we are all from one source. And so these artificial divisions that we humans have created for ourselves, black, white, rich, poor, meaningless. We are all from one place, and inshallah, we will go back to that one place. The challenge for us as humans is to maintain that understanding. And that verse should provide that perspective, whether rich or poor, beggar, whoever, homeless, we, should, we all should realize we come from that same source. The second stage, according to the verse in Surah Al-Sajjah, uh, Sajjah, verses 7 through 9, is that our souls are then placed in our mother's womb. And after the first trimester, trimester, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathes into our soul his spirit. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thus he begins the creation of man out of clay, then he causes him to be begotten out of the essence of a humble fluid. And then he forms him in accordance with what he is meant to be and breathes into him of his spirit. And thus, O men, he endows you with hearing and with sight and feelings as well as minds. Yet how seldom are you grateful. The miracle of our human life now. Our soul comes from the heaven, it's placed into our mother's womb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blows his spirit into the womb. Now, is all of this scientifically provable? No, not right now. It comes from the basic fundamental aspect of our faith, of the al ghaib the unseen, that we believe this, we understand it. Not everything that happens in our lives do we understand, nor should we maybe. But this is part of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran. And so the perspective again here and from the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathes into each and every one of you and us his spirit. SubhanAllah. Contemplate that idea for a second. Contemplate that for a moment. That Allah, there is a, that as Allah puts it in the Quran, his breath is within each and every one of us. How precious, how privileged we are to be human beings. He doesn't say that I placed or I inserted. He says he breathed. And when the, we talk about breath, it reminds us of the unconscious activity that we do 24 hours a day, seven days a week dreams of our breathing. And when our breath stops, our human lives stop. And so we all come from the same source. We all have his spirit blown into him, blown into us rather. 
and it should again remind us that we are all interconnected. The artificial divisions that we create in our humanity are just that, artificial. Okay, the third stage. The third stage is now where we are familiar with, where we are born from our mother's wombs. We are now born into this life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as he says, this life is meant to test us, meant, meant to put us through trials and challenges. And for the first two years of our lives, we are solely dependent upon our mother, or on our parents, to take care of us before we can start somewhat fending for ourselves. But what does the law say about this life that we have been born into, this stage that our soul is in? And there'll be a stage after this now that we'll get into, but what does he say about this stage? He says, uh, in Surah Al-Barad, verily we have created man into a life of pain, toil, and trial. He also says in Surah Al-Anam, that this life is but a passing period. And nothing in this life of this world is but a play and a passing delight. And the life in the hereafter is by far better for all who are conscious of God. Will you not then use your reason? For those of us who are a little bit older, think about how fast your life has gone so far. I'm 52 years old. I can't believe, subhanAllah, just a second ago, I was 21. Life goes by very quickly. And the Quran validates that. That this life is but a play and a passing delight. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, again, as I said before, for indeed the life to come will be better for thee than this earlier part of your life. So this life, this stage of our soul's, exi soul's existence is just a beginning, if you will. It's just a start. Whether you're five or 50 or you're 100, know that whatever we encounter in this period, 60, 70, 80 years, and what the law of averages or whatever is that people will go until 80, 85 years old, whatever it is, it's just a small start. You're just getting started. The akhirah is where the real life starts. And so let us move to that fourth stage, which is transitioning, death, what we would call death, and what the Quran, of course, calls death. But I would also posit that it is a transition. For, like I said, our bodies die. Our bodies eventually become weak and tire out, but our souls are the ones that continue on. And in accordance to the Quran, and according to the Quran, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, the 23rd Surah, and the 100th verse, Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gives an indication of what happens at that moment of death. He gives an indication of what happens to our soul when we pass. He says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, those who leave the world, there is a barrier of death until the day when all will be raised from the dead. Sadiq Allah The barrier, or as it is commonly understood, Barzakh. That we move from this life into, and this is where I go back to the verse I said earlier that God has given us only very little knowledge, but from what we can stitch together and from what the scholars that I researched said, is that our soul moves into a waiting area, if you will, barzakh. And the barzakh is where, what happens in barzakh, the Christians call it purgatory, we don't believe in the concept of that, that same concept. Barzakh, when our soul arrives there, from everything now, and I will share with you the near-death experiences in just a moment, for those of us who are believers, for those of us who have, as the, God, as, uh, the Quran says and as God says, who believe in him and do good works, the angels will welcome us. The angels will welcome us. We will move into Barzakh with love. We will move into Barzakh with peace. 
in our souls. And so the scholars say that Barzakh is the place where the believers rest, are restored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's love, and we wait until Yawmiddin. We wait until the Day of Judgment. And finally, that is that fifth stage of our soul, Maliki Yawmiddin, the Lord of the Day of Judgment, where he will then roll out our deeds. He will look at how we have performed. He will judge us. And inshallah, may all of us be the, be the winners on that day. Inshallah, may all of us be reunited, not just in Jannah, although I'll we'll take Jannah, but Jannah to Firdos. Inshallah, inshallah, inshallah. And so, there's a very interesting uh, description of what happens on uh, uh, Maliki Yom Medina in Surah Al-Waqiyah, the 56th Surah of the, of the Quran. I've read it many times. And I'm going to just paraphrase what the first quarter of the Surah says about what happens. You know, they say in the world, oh, you know, there's only two types of people in the world, or there's three categories of people in the world. Here in Surah Al-Waqiyah, it tells us each one of us are going to fall into one of three categories. The first category, our people will go to heaven. And how pleased will they be going to heaven? The second category is people who will go to hell. And the third category are people who will go to genital for dose. And those, who are the people that will go to genital for dose? The people that will go to genital for dose, the highest level of heaven, are the sabikun. The people who were foremost in two things, faith and good works. What defines faith? Only Allah knows what defines faith. Your relationship with God, nobody can judge that except God. Faith and good works. Now mind you, it doesn't say for people who never sinned. We are all sinners. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says as much throughout the Quran, is the most forgiving. So inshallah, may any of and all of our sins be wiped from the slate. And may all of us be considered the sabikun. Mm. Genital for dose, uh, sometimes uh, people think, uh, you know, it's limited real estate. It's not limited real estate. Inshallah, the heavens are beyond any concept that we can imagine in our limited human minds. And inshallah, may I see you in genital for dose. And in the second part of the khutbah, I want to share with you some of the things that are now being experienced by humans in this life that validate what the Quran says. Qudu Allah, ask Allah for whatever you want. In 2011, the polling organization Gallup, which is a very reputable organization, so hopefully some of you have heard of the Gallup poll and, and what they, they do various polls for politicians and for organizations, and they're over 100 years old, I believe. They found it such to do a poll of Americans to ask the question, how many Americans have had a near-death experience? What am I talking about a near-death experience? I'm not talking about, you know, you get into a car accident and you say, oh my God, I almost died. I'm talking about what has become a growing body of evidence of people who have had a spiritually transformative experience people who have passed and come back. Now, this may be something that has been addressed seldomly from this minbar, but I imagine it's something that some of you may have heard because what they found is roughly 3% of Americans 
which translates over to 9 million people, if we have about 300 million people, 3% have had some sort of experience like that. Now, look, I understand how that sounds. That when people say, I, you know, died and I experienced something and then I came back, oh, wait a minute, hold on a second, man. Uh, you may need to take something. Or, uh, wait a minute, you may, uh, there is far too many stories now. There are far too many reports. As a matter of fact, the University of Virginia Medical School has now uh, started a whole school or division related to this. What does this mean? What does this mean that you have such a growing number of people? And by the way, it's not just Christians and Jews, it's Muslims, it's people, atheists, it's agnostics. It's people who have died, gone to the other side, and come back. And I'm going to share a couple of stories that are the most credible stories that we've gotten so far. And again, I remind you of Isra al Mirage. And the, you know, we've been taught it throughout our lives, maybe as children, about uh, uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's, you know, uh, getting onto the horse of Barak, being transported to Jerusalem, ascending to heaven. If you weren't a Muslim, if that wasn't part of your culture, you might think that to be crazy. But it is part of our culture. And it is something, actually, type of experience, <coughs> not that, of course, but type of experience that others are having. Now, the university, like I said, the University of Virginia, a mainstream medical school, they define a near-death experience, and it's a medical definition, not a spiritual one, or a religious one, it says a near-death experience is a profound psychological event that may occur to a person close to death or, if not near death, in a situation physical or emotional crisis. But it, because it includes the transcendental and mystical elements, an NDE is a powerful event of consciousness, not a mental illness. So this idea of acknowledging in a world and in this country where a materialist state is, exists, that if science can't prove it, it doesn't exist. That for many in our, in our world who say, you know, can you prove that God exists? If you can't prove it, don't talk to me. Can you prove to me what happens after our bodies die? If you can't prove it, you're sort of cuckoo. It is now coming to bear that there is something that our materialist society is starting to acknowledge. We call it a soul. We call it our ruh. They call it consciousness. That consciousness that we have here in this life, they are saying now survives the bodily death. Welcome to the club, folks. We Muslims could have told you that a long time ago. And so Dr. Jeffrey Long he is the founder of an organization called the Near Death Experience Research Foundation. He is a radiation oncologist practicing in Louisiana. He has investigated over 4,000 near death experiences. And I'm certainly uh, uh, not going to be you know, going through all 4,000, but there is uh, some. There are actually, he came up with 12 elements that are common amongst these 4,000s. About when the, when the person dies, the type of experience, them leaving their bodies, going into a light, going through a tunnel, a life, there's, there's 12 elements to it. I'm not gonna go through and enumerate all of it. Rather, I'm gonna share a couple of stories in the very short time that we have left. The first is from a gentleman named Dr. Eben Alexander. Dr. Eben Alexander is a Harvard-trained brain surgeon. He wrote a book called Proof of Heaven. But before he wrote that book, he himself had a near-death experience. Now, prior to having his experience, he was a classic scientist, a science-based materialist. In other words, that the idea of an afterlife, the idea of a soul, well, if you couldn't prove it, it didn't make sense, it didn't exist. But this doctor, even Alexander, who did not believe in God, one day came down with meningitis. Meningitis is a viral infection of the brain. And it completely, I mean, once you get meningitis, it's very rare that you're gonna come back from that. 
So he came down with meningitis. He fell into a coma. You can read his book and find his story online. He fell into a coma, he was admitted to hospital, and there, all brain activity stopped. His heart was still pumping, but no electrical activity, nothing happening in the brain. And it was that case for two weeks. So he caught, this was in 2008, and doctors basically told him, uh, told his family that he had a slim to zero chance of surviving. But as Dr. Alexander recounts in his book, again, Proof of Heaven, it's on the New York Times bestselling list, you can go find it uh, if you wish, he recounts the heavenly realm that he actually found himself in. He recounts that when he, when the meningitis set in, he went to a realm where he encountered the angels. He went to a realm where he reconnected with his deceased sister. That he went to a realm where he experienced a life review. And this is one of the things I want to talk about. It's something that when you read these stories and when you listen to these stories about near-death experiencers, they all experience a life review. I don't think it's, it's not the day of judgment or anything like that. But what it is, it was very interesting, and, and I've watched hundreds of them myself, the person goes through review of how they treated other people in this life. And by the way, the review is from a lost pilot, from, us, from the creator. When a person goes to the next life, one of the things they clearly find and they meet is they call it, they call it a lost pilot out of their creator or the source or God. And in that time you go through a life, life review and one of the key things that I've always taken away is in that life review, you are shown how you treated other people in this life. This is not Quran, by the way, not Hadith. This is purely something that I've learned and taking away, so I want to be clear about that. But I think there is something to it. And so how you treated other people, and how you, and, and you see how you treated peop other people from their viewpoint. How you spoke to that store clerk, you see it from their viewpoint. How you spoke to your child, you see it from their viewpoint. How you spoke to your mother, your father, whoever, you see it, the pain that you have caused. And as they all put it without, a, without any hesitation, said, my God, I wish I had never spoken that way. I wish I had never, and it comports with what we as Muslims believe in talking in, kind, in a kind way, in a respectful way. So I wanna just fast forward here since we're running out of time. There is another story from the United States Navy Chief Petty Officer, Tony Woody, a multi-decade veteran of the United States Navy. He flew aircraft, Navy aircraft, to spy on other countries. He flew Navy aircraft to detect submarines in the ocean. I won't get into exactly how he started. You can look him up on, on YouTube or whatever, but this was a military man, a hardened man, somebody who was trained to kill, and he had an experience where he too went to another realm. He too found himself in heaven. And one of the things he described that will sit with me and that I'll share with you is that he didn't consider himself religious, but he met the creator, our creator, your creator, my creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says, the love that I experienced from the creator I have spent decades trying to describe, and then let me quote what he says. He says, imagine every mother that has ever lived and the love they would have for their firstborn child. Imagine that love if you can. And then imagine every mother that will ever live between now and the end of time, whenever that is, and imagine the love they will have for their child. Imagine that love, and I'm here to tell you, he says, that if you think about that, and the love that that means, that can't hold a candle to the type of love that God forgives you. That can't hold a candle to the type of love that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has for each and every one of us. And so love is what it's about in many respects. Love is where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually takes us. And we should be grateful to God. 
and thankful to God, Allah Akbar. There are distressing NDEs. I can't get into it now because I'm running out of time. About 10% of those 3% uh, go to hell and they experience hell. And there is a story by Mr. Matthew Boxford who talked about going into the hellish realm. His skin burned off and then it regenerated. That's a verse from the Quran, folks. This is a person who has never read the Quran. But that mimics, the, that reflects the verse in Surah Al-Nisa. For verily those who are bent on denying the truth of our messages, we shall in time cause to endure the fire. And every time their skins are burnt off, we shall replace it with new skins. I'm watching this guy's video and I'm thinking of this verse. SubhanAllah. Anyhow, as I conclude here, the, 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 the lessons, the takeaways that I would like to convey is that we do not die. We do not stop our existence. We move into the next realm of existence. And that next realm of existence is filled with harmony and love and compassion. And it's for those of us who believe in God and do good works, whoever of God's creation in humanity. O oh Allah, please guide us to purity and the straight path in this life and genital for those in the next. Please imbue us with your love and acceptance and forgive our sins. O oh Allah, please give relief to all those suffering, no matter their faith, as only you can provide relief. Please replace their suffering with ease. O oh Allah, please bless and guide our community here at the Islamic Center and beyond. We express our love for you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we look forward to meeting you, inshallah. We come to salah. الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح قد قامت الصلاة قد قامت الصلاة الله أكبر الله أكبر لا Allah Allah دين الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الذين آمنوا استعينوا بالصبر والصلاة إن الله مع الصابرين ولا تقولوا لمن يقتل في سبيل الله أموات بل أحياء ولكن لا تشعرون ولنبلونكم بشيء من الخوف والجوع ونقص من الأموال ونقص من الأموال والأنفس والثمرات وبشر الصابرين الذين إذا أصابتهم مصيبة قالوا قالوا إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون أولئك عليهم صلوات من ربهم ورحمة 
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله استغفر الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our prayers and our duas inshallah I would like to thank our khatib brother Omar Ricci for this beautiful khutbah May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and bless your family members. I would like to remind you that, dear brothers and sisters, we will have the food pantry tomorrow at 9 a.m. all the way until 11.30 a.m. behind the Islamic Center in the parking lot. Uh, so if you know anyone who is in need of help, please inform them. And then also, you know, we have started recently in-person prayers, but we still do some uh, virtual programs, uh, nightly programs. And on Mondays, we have the message of the Quran at 9 p.m. Uh, via Zoom, please join us. And then on Thursdays, the program is called Spiritual Fireside Chat. And this is at 9 p.m. as well via Zoom. Please join us, inshallah. And it is also uh, streamed by, on uh, Facebook. So the Eid al-Adha is expected to be on uh, July 20th at 8.30 a.m. The program will start, inshallah, with Tekbirat. So the, the program is going to, or the prayer is going to take place in a Royal Park in South Pasadena. 
you can find all the detailed information on our website and then also in the newsletter. If you don't receive the newsletter, you can always sign up for this uh, beautiful service as well to be informed about the Islamic Center's uh, programs. And then also uh, there's another program coming on July 9th, and this will be serious. Uh, it is called A New Approach, the pa Palestinian, Palestinian Struggle. So this, this will be via Zoom and Facebook as well, inshallah. Again, you can find the detailed information from our website. Uh, finally, uh, our thrift shop is back, a grand reopening. So great deals uh, at the shop. Uh, all the proceeds go to New Horizons School, 100%. Please uh, visit the thrift shop and support our school. Uh, and finally, please, please donate generously and support our beautiful center. Insha'Allah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your prayers and your donations. Let us pray for those who are sick and passed away. Allahumma shfi mardana, Allahumma mawtana, Allahumma fri al-mumina wal-muminat, wal-muslimina wal-muslimat, al-ahyai minhum wal-amwat, inna ka samiyahum qareemu mubibu al-da'awat. Ameen. Wa Allah, please give quick healings for those who are sick. Wa Allah, bless the souls of those who passed away. Forgive them, forgive their mistakes and shortcomings and accept them in the highest level of paradise. Amin. Walhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, Al-Fatiha.